Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today's lesson topic is going to be working online for drummers and percussionists. So this is something I've been doing for years and years, ever since the internet got fast enough to uh, either play online with a studio with an ISDN line, or most commonly is composers from around the world sending me tracks that I put drums on and then send them back. So that doesn't take uh, much, uh, you know, struggle at all. You know, you can use WeTransfer or Dropbox or any of these transfer uh, file systems. So the big thing that I do for this is I will have relationships with particular composers or arrangers or uh, just, you know, touring musicians where they have a piece or an album and they've got drums programmed on that album and they want to replace them with live drums. So it's very common. And even in the old days, in the 1980s, when I lived in New York, I would go into the studio and replace drum machine tracks because, you know, in the late 70s and through the 80s, the drum machine came into pro prominence and almost, you know, took over everybody's work for a while. So a lot of us bought drum machines and then we learned how to program them. And then we did that and then for the record, uh, a lot of times the composer or the producer, if they had any money left over, they'd say, you know, this isn't really doing it. Let's uh, bring in a live drummer. So I got a lot of work that way. So I'd actually program the drums and then replace myself. <laughs> so these days, and especially with this pandemic going on and nobody's playing live gigs, uh, a lot of people are still at home composing and doing film scores and music and, uh, you know, big band charts and all kinds of things. And in a way, they have more time than ever now. So they're doing a lot of composing. So I have several relationships, like I said, with composers uh, all over the world. And this is a big source of income for me. And during this pandemic, it's been one of those things that I've been doing a lot of to make some money to uh, feed my family. So today I've gotten permission from one of uh, my friends, and he's a really great trumpet player and a really good composer and arranger. And he wrote a couple tunes and recently had me put drums on them. And what he's going to do is uh, he wanted to hear these arrangements that he did with live musicians. So he programmed everything on Sibelius, which is a music notation program. Uh, and it's very basic, you know, with a click and some artificial horns and kicks. And then he put a live bass player on there and then asked me uh, if I would put drums on there. And so he sent me the charts and it's a, it's a paid gig. And, you know, I just over, you know, maybe uh, three or four hours, I put some drums on there. So you do have to set up the kit and mic the kit and make sure it sounds really good. So that's, you know, one thing you're gonna have to do if you're gonna do this, you're gonna need a way to make sure you can get a good live drum sound. Now, a lot of times these are kind of either spec deals or scratch tracks. So a spec deal, uh, it comes from the old days where you would do a bunch of tunes and then shop it. A lot of times the record companies would have uh, artists do a lot of spec work so they could write it off. They'd have a write off at the end of the year. And a lot of times I did so many spec things in New York and I don't know how many did or didn't come out. Every once in a while, I'll hear something, I'm like, don't I, doesn't that sound familiar? But who knows, it's been so long. So I did, you know, there was a time when I did two or three of those a week where I'd go into the studio and record like that. Nowadays, it's not as common because there really are no record companies doing anything like that anymore. So most of it happens online, like I said earlier. So once you have a drum sound, and again, I did my videos on um, recording and all that, you could look at those and you know, you have a way of exporting all this data, you need to think about what kind of work you're going after. So if you're a really great rock drummer and you feel confident doing that, then you should try to go after that work. Now to do that, you're gonna to need to really be able to play with a click track and you're gonna be able to be very flexible and also take orders. And if, if someone doesn't like something, 
you need to be able to fix it, you need to be able to offer suggestions to actually help the composition or the arrangement. These are all things that people I work with value that I offer. Like I might say, you know, if a bass line's a certain way, and that's actually one of the tunes we're gonna to cover today, uh, the kind of feel, I might say, you know, let's switch that feel because I think it'll work better. Let me show you what that'll sound like. I, I might send them some samples of tunes, uh, you know, that are, that are out or whatever, and they can hear those and they might say, oh, that's great. Or they might say, nah, let's just keep it the way it is. And that's totally fine. So those are things that people usually appreciate it if you do that in the right way. But never, ever say, I'm going to do it my way and that's it. And if someone says, I want you to sound like Steve Gadd, then try to sound like Steve Gadd, you know? You're working for them. Now, as far as how much you charge, that's up to you. If it's someone that you work with a lot and you're friendly with them, you can give them a break. That's what I do. I normally charge $100 an hour. So if it's going to take me an hour to set up the drums and do the track, that's what I'm going to charge. If it's a whole record, which will probably take me, you know, about a day, depending on how complex the music is, then I'm going to probably give them a rate of six or seven hundred dollars to do that. You know, and that's really not so bad when you're getting a live drummer to do that and I get a really good drum sound and everybody's usually happy. So that's the way we do it. Now for the spec deals and things that I might do over later on, I might give them a, letter, a better deal, maybe $50 an hour. So I know I'm going to be going back and probably redoing it once everything is on those tunes. So in other words, they've done all the sequencing. They maybe used a notation program like Sibelius, like I said before, or Finale to do all the sequence stuff and have a click on there. The first thing they do is they want to put drums on there because that's the heartbeat for everything, drums and bass. So either one of those first, but they need to be on there. So when you do that track, you're doing the best you can and you want to make it sound good, but really you're not hearing anything else that's on there. If there's a vocal, you're not hearing that. There might be a scratch vocal, but a lot of times there isn't. And if it's a big band tune, certainly you're not hearing the power of a big band, you know? You're not hearing any piano or rhythm section, you're just hearing what the scratch track that they've put on Sibelius or Finale or whatever other program they're using. And it's usually a notation program because they can just use a MIDI file created from that notation program. It's very convenient for composers and arrangers to do that. So the two tunes I'm going to show you today are from a big band project that, again, a guy that I know is working on. and. He wanted to do the drums and the bass first, and the bass was already recorded, a scratch track, and then I put drums on there, and then what he's going to do is have uh, all kinds of people playing it, all the horn players and the other rhythm section players, and then I'm sure I'll get it back maybe to mix it if he decides to use me to do the mixing because I do that too, or just to put a drum track, another drum track on there. If it doesn't work, that might associate better with what's on there now. So sometimes it's a little like chasing your tail, but the idea is to get the best possible drum track you can get on there. That means time needs to be solid, the dynamics need to be there, everything, the magic needs to be there, and especially the energy needs to be there, because you got to remember there might be a lot of people playing over that, so that track needs to be energized and, and needs to make that composer or arranger excited about what they've done. And, you know, putting live drums on something when there are no drums can be a really amazing experience if it comes out well. All right? So I've gotten a lot of feedback over the years just saying really nice things, you know, this is completely different than what I imagined, but I love it. Or this is exactly what I imagined, and I love it, and, and all that. So what we're going to do today is I'll give you a little example of something that I did last week. Um, I do maybe, you know, one or two of these a week. And some are rock, some are Latin. Sometimes I'm playing just percussion, hand percussion, congas, uh, drum set, sometimes vibes. You know, I'm doing that. That's why I'm set up with that set, this setup here. I'm putting vibes on a record. So, uh, you know, it varies. And the more you can do, the more money you're going to make. So if you play percussion and vibes and drum set, you can knock all that stuff out on a record and end up doing really well. And it's really fun, too. And it's very rewarding. There's nothing bad about it, unless if the musicians you're working with aren't great. In other words, you get a track that's not good, but I don't do those. So if I get a track that's not good, I just won't do it. I'm lucky enough to be in that situation. All right? So these tunes we're going to do today, there's two different ones. One is called King of the Road, and it's a famous tune by Roger Miller. And uh, a friend of mine, like I said, Brad Wilcox, I'll name his name, 
He's a, a really fine term player and arranger. He knows what he wants. So he sent me this uh, chart, and I'll post some of it on the screen. And he sent a click, a rough bass track, and some synthesized horns. <laughs> All right. So it's not very powerful, but you know, I had to kind of imagine what it would be. And they sent also a description of what he wanted. So normally there'll be a click count off, maybe three counts, and then there'll be a drum fill as you see here on the chart. And then um, if it's a composer and arranger who's used to writing drum charts, then uh, you're going to be in good shape. In this case, I kind of consulted with him a little about writing the drum chart because he hadn't done too many of those. And so this is what we came up with, and I think he did an amazing job uh, on it. Uh, so I wrote in things here and there that we changed. I'm sure you'll hear those on the recording. So I will play this video that I did as I was recording uh, the take that we're using for the drum scratch. And it may be the keeper take, who knows. And so we'll play this now and then we'll talk about it. So that's it. You just heard King of the Road, and that was the take that we came up with that the horn players are going to play over that. And you saw that uh, the directions on the chart are pretty specific. In other words, gives you the tempo, gives you drum fill in the beginning. There's three clicks, then you come in. So not a lot of time, so you got to get ready. And then hard swing. Now, in this case, that hard swing was a floating swing because... There's no, the bass is just pedaling, going bump, bum. So uh, the bass player is not walking there. So you need to play more of an open kind of thing there and not just two and four. So that's really important there. So because it's kind of floating and the saxes are playing their runs, try not to get in the way, but you can complement that 
So not too busy, but busy enough so it fills in everything. And then after the second ending, you do a little fill that decrescendos and goes into letter A, which is uh, one. And those hits need to be not too heavy, but precise. And you need to have command over those because you're helping the band play clearly through that. And then the fills can be simple at first. This head happens many times. So, you know, the AABA form, that happens like, I don't know how many times through the tune, but probably eight times or so. And so each time you can do it a little bit differently and you can get a little creative as I did on this take. And I did two takes. And if the uh, composer doesn't like one, we can play simpler, that's fine. I have no problem doing that. But normally for the jazz, big band stuff, you can, uh, you know, stretch out just a little. So as the tune goes on in that A section, I take a little bit of liberties and do a little bit different things. I might do triplets. I might play a little bit stronger and louder just to build excitement. And then it goes into uh, this um pa pa um pa pa um pa, which is what's written. But you don't want to play that like um pa pa um pa pa um pa. You want to kind of uh, shade it. So you're playing some of those marcato accents but not so it sounds like you're playing in a military band. All right, that's what's important. And then all these cutoffs and short notes to marcato notes need to be clean. So no ringing cymbals. I'm using some cymbals with sizzles. So I make sure I cut those off when I have to. So you gotta be really careful of that so everything's really clean. And then at letter B, it says swing. So there, we're just breaking into the head of the tune. Uh, again that's walking all right now some of this might be solos or might be sax soli uh like at letter c so in that case i switched to this china symbol you know i call it china symbol it's it's the um the peisty traditional 22 inch swish symbol that i love behind sax solo so i switched to that and then uh it says strong backbeat so in that case you play two and four because that's what the composer or arranger wants to hear. And then come down again, and we're back to letter D, which is the head once again. Now, remember, there's no solos on the tune yet. So the solos happen at letter F. And you just have to imagine there's someone blowing over what you're playing. So don't get too aggressive there. Or you might mess up what the soloist wants to play. So when you're not playing with a soloist, then you have to be a little more conservative, as in this case. And then these figures... It says last time only. Now in this case, they did the solo section twice. Um, so that happens twice. And then the live version, the, the band leader would just do that, which would mean going on to G. Okay, so that could be open for solos. It breaks into before H, this half time. So it says slow down to half time. Now the click keeps going. so. It's a little bit difficult here. Normally, you'd slow down a little bit under the click. You'd play behind the beat, but in this case, we got to stay with that click. So that halftime uh, is still, you know, fairly bright for a shuffle. But I like it. I think it sounds really good. So we do that letter H as a shuffle with a backbeat, and he wants it heavy. So I'm playing a lot of backbeat and then catching those figures at 153 on. And then uh, bar 161 at the end of that bar, but 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 uh, fill into double time again the click's still going so you got to do that just like the beginning and then make sure the last four bars are extremely clean and short all right because those horns are going to be getting off on those notes so that's to talk through and you know really i'm a lot of times when i have a lot of these i'm pretty much all i need is sometimes one take maybe two the, the time comes in setting up everything <laughs> uh cutting the tunes is fast all right. Once I hear it a few times and, you know, listen back, I'll go in and listen back and see if something's working. If it's not, I just fix it. OK, so that's what that is. Now, the next tune is was originally a samba. But when I heard the speed of it and I listened to it, I recommended that the composer turn it into a bayon, which is a little different bass line. So instead of doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom it's boom, boom, do, 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 do. So I went ahead and uh, had him see if he could change that bass line. And, and so he did. And the, this tune is a little bit difficult because it's so fast uh, on the you know, samba groove at 49. But it starts out 
with this kind of uh, horn section thing, and then goes into a, a 5-4, and it says Sama Groove, but it's more of a kind of a bossa nova. Now, in this case, I know there's going to be percussion on it, because he told me. So I'm playing really light on the cymbals, okay? So there's room, and I'm thinking that later on, I would have the congas playing time, and the drums not playing time, because it's too heavy, and just playing cymbals like I do there, like almost like a kind of an ECM kind of thing. And the congas or maybe a shaker or something laying down the time there. So that's what I'm envisioning for this tune. Uh, and we'll see if it comes to fruition. And by the way, after all this is done, it may take a few months. I'm going to post these again with the finished finish version so you could see uh, how it turned out. Okay. So in this beginning section, well, you know what? I'll tell you, before I talk through it, let me play it for you. It's now called Bayonne de Basso uh, instead of Samba. He changed the name because we changed the groove. And we'll let you hear this, and then I'll comment when we come back. Thank you. 
So there you go with that. And you see the Bayonne and you see how I switched some symbols for this as well. So for the King of the Road, I was using a, a dark 22 inch Pisces traditional ride. Now here I'm using that Sabian uh, Jack D. Jeanette symbol, which has a great bell. It also, it's, it stands out in the mix, but it's not obnoxious. So it's dark, but dry. And that works really well for this kind of tune. I didn't want to use a lot of bell because again, there's going to be a lot of percussion on this tune and I didn't want to play too much of that. So all I want to do is create a nice cushion of air for all that percussion to play over. So a lot of times I'm playing pretty reserved, you'll notice on some of this. Now in the beginning, we already talked about that, how that's just kind of an ECM thing. And I, I get a little more intense as we get to letter B, till it, at letter B it kind of gets uh, fortissimo or forte, very loud. And so you want to open up there and play some toms like I did and more cymbals and, and just basically grooving. And then by the time you're back to C, you're going back kind of to that original groove, maybe some cross room click and so on. But then we get to bar 49 and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it goes into a double time feel by own, which is very fast. And you want to do a fill into that, just a little fill, nothing too choppy. So I go ba -da -boom, bam and into that. And then it's kind of a drum slash percussion feature for two bars, but I left room for the percussion. So I'm right, right now I'm just playing that basic Bayonne groove and a couple drum fills. The bass comes in on that third bar and then we're off to the head, which starts at D with the horns. And he's got these figures written. And they're not real strong right now because they're done synthesized with Sibelius. So I'm not playing them too heavy. And you don't want to play those really heavy. Nice and light, and you want to shade them. And then that rhythm keeps going. And then at G, it says bass solo. Now, I wasn't really sure about that, but I think there may be an instrumental solo over that. Um, but just in case, I kept it nice and easy, just in case the bass is playing. But now the bass is playing time over it. So uh, that person might overdub a bass solo over that. And then we get to H, which is really fun. That's a little percussion feature. And I did do a drum solo in there. Now we could always take that out and put a timbali solo in there. But for now, I needed to fill it up with something because there's so many other players, a whole big band playing over this. So uh, I did add drums on this. So I just improvised a little in there. And then at I, it's a clean stop on the downbeat. And then you build it up to the and that needs to be very short, very sharp. And then you're back in the head and the climax of the tune is at letter J where the whole ensemble is playing the head. I, I gotta say, this is really nice arranging, it's beautiful. And that goes on and it comes down again at L to kind of a bass solo once again. And so I go down to the hi-hat, which I haven't done yet. So I'll probably do something uh, percussive there, congas or something, a little bit of a fill-like groove at L and then build that up to the end at 143 and then you know the big ending once again very short with the horns but you want to feel like you're tonguing those notes all right so those are two contrasting tunes a latin tune and a big band jazz tune now these are both big band tunes uh there's going to be full rhythm section guitar piano uh, five saxes four bones five trumpets maybe four trumpets. I'm not sure about that, but it's going to be a big, big group. Okay. 18 or 19 folks. So I play like that if I know what it is. Now, if this is a rock session and eventually I'll, I got to get permission to do these. Most people don't want their, their arrangements uh, online like this, but I got permission from him and it's all copyrighted. So it's all good. But, um, but if I can get permission to do some of the rock stuff that I do uh, like this, then I will post it. Okay. I've been waiting for someone uh, to, to let me do it. And this is an inter interesting project. So, uh, so I thought I'd, I'd put it up here. So that's how I'm able to do a lot of work if I'm not doing gigs. So I consider this a gig. So if I'm not going out playing with the orchestra, no one's coming into the studio now because, you know, everybody's kind of isolated and we can't really do that. So everything's gone online and we're doing sessions online, sometimes through an ISD online, everybody live because it's fast enough to do that. Uh, now there's actually some programs that will let you do things if you've got a hardwired connection. In other words, a Cat6, Cat5 to Cat6 cable uh, to your router or modem. You can get some programs out and there's several of them 
uh, that get, uh, I think Clearstream is one, not sure of the name, but uh, you get rid of that latency. So now it's becoming possible for, for guys to play live without an ISDN connection, which is really cool. So I'm looking forward to that as it develops. But you know what you want to understand is that the more versatile you are, the more kinds of sessions you'll do. I do, like I said before, you know, rock, funk, Latin, on all the instruments, really. So I even do orchestration for folks. Um, you know, I put all the mal instruments on, it's endless. So that's what you do. And the more stuff you can do, the better you can, you know, do as making a living as a professional player. And this is the future. So you all need to learn it. Thanks.